Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Inflamed Sisters Thriving Podcast, a safe space created to guide women living with chronic illnesses to uncover their purpose by doing what they were meant to do, move in power by advocating for themselves and accelerate their growth in health, career, and business. You will learn how to stop hiding and to finally start thriving. We will inspire, educate, and motivate you as we show you Inflamed Sisters Thrive together always. As you know, my name is Katina Morrison. I am your host, and I am here today with my amazing guests, Amy and Keith. How are you doing today? Great. Good. Thank yeah, you. How, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful. You know, I've had a challenging last week, but what is a beautiful thing to do is to get back into the rhythm of things and to meet with amazing, uplifting people like the two of you. So Thank would you. you Thank you. You're welcome. Would you two like to introduce yourselves? Let's start with Keith. Yep. So uh, my name is uh, Keith Mayers. I will try to keep this brief because I'm <laughs> guilty sometimes of doing too much talking. Um, where do I start? Um, I would define myself as what's called a coaching psychologist. That's basically a psychologist who coaches, but it was a long journey which got me here, which I'm sure as we speak, um, my story will unfold unfold across this podcast. And uh, it, it basically, the journey began about 11 years ago when I was diagnosed with a very rare uh, illness called Wegner's granulomatosis, which um, uh, it has been renamed as granulomatosis with polyangitis. It, it falls under the umbrella disease term vasculitis, which is an autoimmune condition. And essentially what happens is uh, the uh, immune system attacks itself. Uh, the vital organs are at risk. Uh, the blood vessels swell and stop delivering blood flow to those major organs. So it can be fatal and uh, yeah, it, it was a very long recovery. And even to this day, though I am a lot better and it doesn't look apparent, there are still several um, remaining symptoms and things that I have to battle. Hmm. Wow. So we are here with not only a psychologist, but a chronic illness warrior um, who is going to show us the ways that he has overcome those challenges and how he's really helping others to do the same. And then we have his lovely wife, who is an amazing warrior herself. Tell us about you and introduce yourself, Amy. My name is Amy Mayers, and I am a content creator and designer. And um, I have been living with narcolepsy for well over 20 years, um, probably now close to 30 years. And um, I think my passion uh, in getting and helping other people is I struggled for a long time with uh, both um, coping with workplace and expectations and I guess what we would call masking my symptoms and um, also getting a diagnosis. It took me about 17 years to actually get a diagnosis. So raising awareness um, and and uh, just uh, helping other people know that there's a lot of us out there that are coping every day and doing the best that we can. Wow. So you two have very... Um... You have very not well. It, the thing is, these stories are not unique because they affect so many people. But it's important that we tell them so people know that they're not alone, because oftentimes when you live with chronic illnesses, you um, don't always run into people who are experiencing exactly what you're experiencing. So spreading the word and sharing it in the way that you do in your platform and helping the community in which in the ways that you do um, is a way that you help people to stop hiding and start thriving. I understand that masking side of things is because I lived for over 30 years with symptoms uh, and kept pushing through to accomplish certain goals, sometimes to my detriment, yeah. um, but other That's times right. to to, to help to, to just accomplish those things so that I could finally be able to provide for myself, support myself, and now to inspire, encourage others. So exactly. we, we need to get into these. Now, you did mention something. When I mentioned that it's sometimes to our detriment, Amy, you said, yes, that's true. What, what was your experience fun. with that? You know, I can remember um, just, try, you know, 
the nature of of having narcolepsy is that you have uncontrollable daytime sleepiness. So being in the workplace and looking like you're effective in that kind of environment, and it doesn't quite matter if you're a secretary or any sort of office-based job, you, if you're not able to take time and take a nap, if you're not able to have access to the medications to help you stay awake, it, it will affect your performance on the job. And impression management, I guess you would kind of call it, um, where you're visibly tired, bags under your eyes, you're yawning, you're trying to stay awake. For me, difficulty uh, sitting still and, and, you know, not, you know, having a relatively sedentary environment was difficult. Long meetings, you know, definitely. Mm -hmm. where, you know, you've got all of your coworkers together in a room and you're nodding off and it's, you know, it shows that you're not interested or not a team player. Really difficult to fit in after a while. Wow. And it took 17 years to get that diagnosis. So all that time dealing with that, we had a very close family friend when I was growing up. She was like a grandmother to me, actually. And um, she had narcolepsy. And I, I remember the experiences that she had, um, you know, trying to still maintain a job, and especially um, being elderly at the time and, and trying to push through and support her family. But it was very challenging, even difficult with doing, you know, things that we take for granted, like being able to drive. Um, she would she was my driver to school um, at times. But um, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm very sensitive to this subject, but it was it was it, yeah. it was some experiences because she didn't have the right medications at that time. And yeah. It was hard yeah. to get the treatment that she needed. And I had to say, you know, I might not be able to ride with you anymore. Um Grandma, um, yeah. <laughs> because uh, this is not working for us. But she did eventually get better treatment and take um, get yeah. you know un get more control over it. But eventually, she wouldn't be able to drive as much as she did. So what I'm saying is, I know because she was my next door neighbor, a person who I was with often, and I saw the struggles. Yeah. Um, and I can I really understand with the career side of things too. Yeah, yeah. It was it, it my the onset of my symptoms happened in my early 20s right as I was transitioning from college into the working world and I studied fashion design and it was my first major job in New York City where I really discovered you know the first day I'm I'm you know working for this apparel company and it's very exciting and um they say we're going to be doing the, the seasonal meeting. So we sit in and it's an all day meeting where they were detailing every new garment that they were producing. And within 15 minutes, I had fallen asleep and didn't even know it. Um, it was so and you know, elbowing. And, and at the end of the day, my supervisor came to me and said, are, are you interested in working with us? Because you were asleep through most of the meeting. And I was like, I, I, I didn't even didn't even realize that I had well, like that much amount of time I had missed and, you know, it kind of and, and, and lasted about six months at that job before, you know, I needed to move on, which, you know, it just, it's kind of sets a precedent where, you know, people don't have the faith or the belief in you that they did when they brought you on and you make a good impression, you know, your stuff and you get hired. But then after that, it's difficult. Um, and that was long before diagnosis as well. So I understand that. Wow. What a story. Keith, let us know. Had, did you have the same challenges facing when you were going through your experience with vasculitis um, or Wagner's back, um, vasculitis? What were your what, how, what did that do to you to develop those symptoms? And did you get answers quickly? Yes and no. Um, I mean, not possibly not quick enough. Um, and, you know, Amy was the one sort of getting the answers as well because she was advocating for me a bit uh, at the time. But, uh, I mean, it, it, I, I say yes, I got answers because I had a very rapid deterioration. Um, and it really was, I mean, literally life and death. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it, it was a six-week period. It wasn't a it wasn't a 17 or 30 year period. 
um, which just started off the first symptoms uh, just after our son Logan was born and we were still uh, living in the in the NICU uh, because he was he was early. Uh, the first symptoms were um, I guess some kind of ear pain or blocked ear which is very common with this disease funnily enough um, and then I went to a doctor after a couple of weeks and they thought it was just some form of infection put me on antibiotics and then a few weeks uh, went by after that uh, I I had labored breathing they decided to give me um, an x-ray of my lungs and then diagnosed me as having pneumonia and tried to treat me with antibiotics for that too um, so that you know there, there were there were misdiagnoses but I don't you know and I don't blame them uh, because it's such a rare unknown disease believe it or not even even these doctors hadn't heard of it um and then eventually it got so bad uh where when, when i say bad um let's say what were the symptoms amy probably remembers this better than i mm. do um coughing up blood mm. uh, skin rashes mm. severe joint ache in my wrist my elbows my knees um couldn't breathe couldn't walk uh, fevers um all the time uh what, and still the ear, the initial ear problems too, that eventually, I, you know, I, w I was being, well, I guess we'd be called a typical guy. I was like, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with me. And Amy was saying to me, there's something very, very wrong with you because you just, I mean, I looked really awful. sick. Awful. <laughs> uh, so she, she forced me into the car, rushed me to the emergency room. We were living in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado at the time. I went in and then um, people were just staring at me. Like I, I mean, I don't know what I looked like, but whatever Amy saw, all these other people, it made me almost feel like I was in the movie The Fly or something, like I just looked like some grotesque horror creature. But uh, eventually I just uh, I, I, I was take, taken into the ER and um, put, on, uh, put on the bed and uh, uh, fed oxygen, uh, and then fed intravenously uh, is that correct Amy? is that what you uh am i telling this right because i was so out of it at the time yeah well actually what they did was they um they had they had to they i think they gave you fluids and they also okay. um it, it was it was really quick actually i just i just remember it took me longer to bundle the two kids up and get to get the three of you in the car and get to the hospital than it did for them to kind of pinpoint the possibility of what the, his diagnosis could be and the doctor looked him all over head to toe you know he's had has all these symptoms and looks at his fingernails and he shows me he's got a little red mark on his fingernails and he goes usually that's an indication of one of two things it's either he's got a bacterial infection in his blood which means that he's going to need to have a heart transplant or he has this autoimmune so we're going to test him for both and see what's wrong with him and I was like, oh, that, that you know, that, that's really comforting either way. Um, and because it was our local hospital, they didn't really have um, the bandwidth to care for such, he, you know, they, they were doing all sorts of other different tests. And, you know, he, so his lungs were filling with fluid, which turned out to be blood. Um, and then it, his kidneys were giving him trouble and his liver wasn't quite functioning the way that it ought to. So they shipped him off to the other hospital across town. So I had to bundle everybody else up again. And, you know, the, the one month old and the four year old in the car and drive across town following the ambulance with, with Keith in it. And um, it was there that they, that they did more, a lot more um, testing and biopsies. Yeah. Bronchoscopy, I think was one of them where, you, you know, they go in and get some sample of the lungs and they send it off to the Mayo Clinic. And um, they said, you know, and doctors, I mean, infectious disease doctors, every or major organ system that you've got. So you've got the kidney doctor and the lung doctor and the, and the rheumatologist um, and, the... and, uh, you know, all, and then the general hospitalist was there as well. And they, they finally said, you know, it's definitely this autoimmune disorder. It, you mm -hmm. know, he, he tested positive for that and they, yeah, yeah. they switched and... course and, treated him in a completely different way than what they had been giving him well i remember i remember the most horrible 
the ho most horrible moment was when they sent you all home and I was there in bed having been told that if this doesn't get treated or diagnosed quickly enough, you know, there was a chance I wasn't going to make it past a couple of days and just sitting with my own thoughts and uh, kind of tr trying to process that was, I would say, the, 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 lo the lowest point of the whole experience uh, because i mean it wasn't just about me obviously it was about you it was about you know a four-year-old and a and a one month old too but uh yeah i mean it was uh it was a real um you know it, it, it did a number of my mind at, at the time um and fortunately they were a very good medical team but you know getting back to the original question you ask yes the diagnosis was rapid in the sense it took six weeks but there were a lot of misdiagnosis which got it to that emergency point i would say yeah because it sounds like the particular condition which is an autoimmune disease as well that you have also um it progresses quite fast and without without a uh, a diagnosis you know as quickly as possible it can actually end very terribly, especially um, in that your case, it seems like you were really at the end of mm. this condition unknowingly. Um, and, you know, medicine as it is, is a um, it's basically they, a rule of a, a process of elimination. Mm. And sometimes when you're going through that process of elimination, a person really doesn't have time physically, um, mm -hmm. mentally, emotionally to be able to cope with the process. Uh, the mm. length of time it takes could actually be a life or death matter. So mm. what a traumatic experience to go mm. through. And then to come out of that and look at you now. Um, <laughs> you're quite a handsome man. It, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it, seems, Thank you. it seems like, and you're a beautiful lady as well, <laughs> uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but you came out of that well to go from the fly. Now, any of us who are from a certain generation, we know what the fly was. Okay. Okay. And I was wondering was, if you were old enough. I, I was I was old enough. And when you said that, I was like, oh no, that was real bad. If you <laughs> are if you looking like the fly, oh no, 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 no. That was had to be scary, Amy. It was. So, it was. Oh my yeah. goodness. And, and and not the Jeff Goldblum version, the, the the version he looks like after he starts turning, yeah. Yes, that's what I imagined. And I was <laughs> trying to keep that image out of my head for as long as possible. That was actually a disturbing movie for me. <laughs> um, it really was. Um, so so you went through that whole process. So you are a couple, both of you have autoimmune conditions. Mm. We kind of touched on the fact that narcolepsy, which is usually a, 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 associated with being, with a sleep disorder, but in this case, as we mentioned, it's now been correlated to autoimmune disease. Um, so it's much bigger than people think. It's not yeah. just sleep. It's your autoimmune system doing yeah, something. Yeah. You know, and in, in, the, in the UK, there are actually, um, there have been several people who unfortunately um, uh, developed narcolepsy symptoms because of um, a flu vaccine that was given out in like the early 2000s. And again, it's, a, it's only in the UK and, um, you know, but there's still enough cases to make it noteworthy and, and make it, a, you know, a news article uh, situation. So, yeah, it's um, you can you can develop narcolepsy in a lot of a lot of you know, lot different, of different ways, different ways. But how do you actually develop Ragnar's vasculitis? And how do you get it? Um, I don't know. They didn't tell me um, specifically. There is no um, absolute in terms of you know the causes or the origins. But there is two things which I I remember. I mean, one is that they talk about autoimmune being hereditary, um, and there are autoimmune conditions amongst many family members of mine. I mean, mostly arthritis. My mother. Mm -hmm has that and you know and we were told at the time that if you have people who have autoimmune within your family then you can get some other you know you can get it doesn't matter what the condition is you can get that so um i suspect that may have had something to do with it but the other thing um how, not, without sounding like a self-diagnosing i just felt under a lot of stress at mm -hmm. the time prior to the build-up and i just it, it's funny because everybody i know who's got some 
from a major illness or chronic illness, like the common denominator always seems to be the stress factor mm -hmm. uh, amongst them. Um, so for me, I was in a job which I didn't particularly enjoy. Uh, funny enough, uh, it was in the disability um, industry. It was uh, it was a medical software which provided disability and long term disability and uh, workers comp guidelines to major companies and their HR departments as well as nurse case managers. But the job itself was it was sales. It was stressful. There were demands in terms of performance um, as well as that. Amy uh, was was pregnant uh, with with Logan and uh, obviously she had her own health conditions too. Then we also had a very active four year old who I was helping to raise while she, she worked nights and she was also, um, apart from working nights, uh, you know, ha had to kind of take it pretty easy. And the other thing was I was always quite a type A personality, a very driven. Um, so um, as well as being fairly fixated on my sales numbers and then what was going into our bank account and all the self-imposed pressure, um, I also was very much into going to the gym and just um, pushing it every time and two hours mm -hmm. in there and you know looking back I do believe I sort of drove myself into the ground a bit thinking I, I was invincible um, and you know, it just got to the point where I, I just remember after Logan was born again and I had this ear thing going on just feeling totally exhausted and it was almost a forewarning thing. I just told Amy I just need a year off I just need I just need convalescence and this is even before I got sick um, and then funny enough, be careful what you wish for. I got exactly that and not in the way that I, I would have hoped, but, uh, it, it was almost like something in my body was crying out to me before this diagnosis that, you know, you just need to take a break. Wow. You know, I'm actually glad we hit on those points because you actually hit on a lot of the things in this conversation. You have both actually hit on a lot of the things that cause, um, autoimmune disease from that flu vaccine, you know, being exposed to toxins or your body's response to something that's been introduced to it, how it can respond to that, to um, stress, which is a huge factor in things, um, of course, to the genetic components and things as well. But of course, we know the things that we eat um, and other, you know, there's other components that have a, a can play a role in it too, but we hit on some of those main factors and especially you as a um, husband and, you know, and we, you, you know, in, in my area, I'm from the South. So we, we, we think of the husband as the head of the family. So we know having to, um, to watch your wife who's pregnant, who also has a chronic illness already. And then you have to struggle through an illness as well that came out of nowhere, it seems, it had to be such a traumatic and challenging time for the two of you. Wow. So how did you come through that? When did you become a psychologist? Were you one at all times? <laughs> no, I wasn't. You know how my brain had, what happens to my brain is so many questions come in at one time. So how did y'all maneuver through those? And then let's <laughs> go, go, go back to that other question. What were some of the steps that you took to really help yourselves grow, you know, to really overcome the challenges? Um, I just, honestly, I went on autopilot for a lot of it. I just, you know, like, I think I just, I, you, you can only control what you can control. And at that point it was just how I reacted to the, the information that was coming at me um, about Keith's diagnosis um, and, and just, you know, doing the best, to juggle both the kids' responsibilities. And then, um, unfortunately, because I was on bed rest for a good month before I had Logan, um, I had to go back to work almost immediately. So um, while Keith was still recovering from, you know, the worst part of, of his illness and just slowly starting to get better, I had to go back to working at night. Um, so it, it, we kind of were really uncomfortable for a while uh and but just you know got got through it and i mean i wish um i wish we were had been in better position to rely on a community of friends or a community mm -hmm. of people but we just we just didn't have that kind of infra infrastructure created for us at the time so we, we relied a lot on each other even then still um 
as Keith was recovering and as I was, you know, wor working as well and kind of get just we just we just got through it. It was as best best we could, you know. We, we we were we weren't even surrounded by family, and we yeah. didn't really have you know a community of friends back then at that point either. I mean, not not really. Um, but I'd say that I mean my my answer to the to your question, Katina, is uh, minimalism, and uh, we're we're mm -hmm. kind of big minimalists. And uh, what I mean by that is not just in terms of when when people think about minimalism, they think in terms of possession. Mm -hmm. um and, and you know owning things I, i'm not just talking about that in some ways not having too many people though we lack the support it also meant that we didn't have people around us pulling us in other directions a lot and one of the you know one of the things one of the common themes i see with people who have long-term and major illnesses and chronic illnesses is so sort of the demands that come from the outside world especially from those who don't understand what they're going through and can kind of have unrealistic expectations and so we i i i would say that we sort of put the shutters down we just like you know amy and i i remember having a meeting and just saying we got to just we, we'll get through this but we really have to just kind of consolidate and minimize um so minimize what we have to do minimize who we interact with minimize what we own what we have to look after so that um actually not not to get too you know jargony or psychological but you know there's a great tool which i know about uh which sort of long before i discovered this tool, we were sort of doing this anyway but it's called the uh the eisenhower matrix or the priority or the priority matrix which kind of divides responsibilities into what's urgent and important what's what's important but not urgent what's not urgent um but so what's not important but urgent and then what's not important and not urgent and then by doing this you kind of have a system whereby you do what you absolutely have to do which in this case would be things like taking medication looking at you know, going to the doctor looking after the kids for in amy's case doing her part-time night job and you know and and that's pretty much it and then putting off other things delegating one or two other things to those who who can do it and then some things you have to cancel altogether so we really did kind of streamline our life tremendously mm -hmm. in order to create a lot of space to deal with this and uh you know the other thing is i think we you know we, we communicate pretty well uh we, we communicate a lot um we and also giving it a meaning um so there had to be sort of a light at the end of the tunnel in all this um regardless of whether you know how you know, whether it, Amy may be living with narcolepsy all her life and I, you know, I'm going to have certain conditions which don't go away. But when you give it a meaning, you find that motivation to, to kind of continue to have that, that willpower, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. So lots of little things to look forward to as well as another. As wow. Another you have hit on a lot of notes um, of things that are important. And I think it, it looks like it may have also brought you closer together. And it also probably opened you up to not only just strengthening that bond with each other, but creating those bonds with others who may have chronic illnesses, mm -hmm. you know, who could understand you. Because I know for myself, um, developing relationships have also been important to me. You know, the work I do as a registered nurse, chronic illness coach has um, actually given me um more purpose as far and, and been fulfilling to me. Mm -hmm. But those connections that I've made within the social media platforms that I, I'm on has also been a huge support as well because, and I didn't even know how much I really needed it until mm. I decided to take the leap to create the, you know, the Instagram page that led to all of this. Mm. Um, so I can, I can see that bond growing stronger. I know that was the case for my husband and I when I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and endometriosis. It was a long journey to those diagnoses, but he was actually a great support. He was there to help me with washing my hair, with getting dressed, with cooking and cleaning and washing clothes while still working, you know, and um, he doing, you know, all of the other things that he did or, you know, around the home and et cetera. 
it was, um, it really showed, you, you know, you really get to see someone's love for you and care in those times when you can't do the things that you take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so I can really understand that. So it's beautiful to see that um, relationship that you have. It really is. And I think this is something that couples, um, married couples, uh, should definitely listen to two who are going through these things because you're not alone either in the, that journey and can connect with others who have similar experiences. Wow. That was actually touching though. Thank Amy, you. was that touching? Definitely. Yeah. It was. <laughs> she said that. It really was. It was, I, I, I actually got myself, I felt myself. I know. I'm get, I'm no, no. <laughs> just a little. I thought I saw your eyes glaze. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, it is. Uh, and one of the things that our audience may not know is that they are visiting us from across the pond. Y'all They 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 actually live in the UK, not too far from some of my family members in the UK. So shout out to uh, Tiana, Janae Mills and Chris Mills. Um, my, and then we have several other relatives, but I'm, I'm shouting them out. They don't live too far from y'all. Um, I wanted to uh, to put that out there. I don't usually give shout outs, but I love my niece and nephew that are over there um, very much. Um, and I have uh, some sister, sister-in-law, brother-in-laws, cousins, all that. You, would, I, Sometimes people are surprised. I've got family all over the world. And yeah. now I have you two um, yes. to come visit when I come that way. Likewise. Um, yeah. Yes, we have to connect. Now, we went through this journey and talked about your um, your diagnoses. We've we talked about the process to getting there. We talked about how you were able to cope and navigate through the challenges. But what we left out is that you're a whole psychologist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How how did your background in psychology, because you spoke about the minimalism, that how that helped, but how did that really help you through this and, and lead to what you're doing now? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the illness, I, I ironically helped the psychology. Um, I mean, it, it led to it. I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't got Wegner's in the first place. And I'm not going to say it was part of a master plan or something which just came about overnight. There were there were ideas I had, and there were things which I got lucky with, I would say, or things which were just serendipity. Um, but I, you know, I sort of just remember um, just lying in the bed. I, um, I think it was possibly even in the ICU um, to begin with, and then I was on a lot of bed rest when I came home. Initially, I was strapped up to, you know, attached to an oxygen oxygen tank to help me breathe, and just really didn't have very many physical capabilities. But my, I, I still had my mind, and my mind, even throughout all of this, was extremely active and just thinking, thinking, thinking. And as soon as I processed, you know, the you know the, the the possible fatality and then realized that the, you know they had diagnosed me and realized that they were treating me with chemotherapy and uh, tons and tons of pregnazone as well as 11 other medications um i i i you know i, I was still trying to figure out why this was happening um and what does this mean and what purpose to give it and i just decided that the purpose with anything any kind of adversity or any anything that's bad is to use that to help the next person who's mm -hmm. going to who's going to go through it and i didn't know what form that was going to take and so you know again i was on long-term disability i was at home for a lot of a, a, you know i was going to say a lot of months but you know about two years really and just figuring out like i don't know i really got to know myself during that whole period very very well in a way that I didn't know before because before I was just an office worker in a sales job and sort of just living um you know just living according to societal norms but then when you're by yourself and you have no one to answer to apart from your health I you know for me that was like me at my most authentic level for the first time in a long time and it got me asking certain questions like who am I really what do I really want to be doing if I get through all this is life too short to be doing something that's transactional something that's just for the money and not for the enjoyment mm -hmm. and then, and it actually started again these are all sort of psychological activities anyway we'll use in certain forms of coaching but it's to kind of get 
yourself to revisit your past self and sort of uh, dreams which never really got followed through them because um, maybe people just said they were unrealistic or they weren't going to lead to the right career. And you know, I, I just started talking to myself. And then one of the things I deduced was I was really, really happy studying psychology at what was in England at the time, um, our equivalent of being at a junior college. It wasn't, I wasn't studying at bachelor's level. It's more like a, a I guess you could say like an associate's degree level mm -hmm. of, of anything. Um, and I decided, you know what, I, I gave this up 20 years ago. Um, and I've, in terms of career, I've not really been that happy since. I want to go back to this again. And then I figured out that, honestly, this is also a way in which I could fulfill that uh, ambition of helping other people who are in who are in the same boat as me. And then that was reinforced because I would go onto all the message boards on Facebook, which I'm still part of um, uh, for the for the vasculitis uh, community. And I, I'd see a lot of themes coming up of like lost self and despair and uh, feeling anxious and feeling stressed and all these things which are related to you know, the human mind, which tie in with psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, um, but, you know, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't immediately, and you know, we talk, you know, this this was all 2011. But by 2015, and we're still living in Colorado. Amy got accepted onto a master's degree in London to study um, design management, mm. and so she was the one who actually got back into education first, which then inspired me every more. So we went we went to London, and then while she was doing that, I began applying, and I didn't actually have a proper bachelor's in psychology which is normally a prerequisite but so I got a lot of rejection a lot of rejection from you know I wanted to do a master's degree course um, because I had a bachelor's already in another subject and eventually um, was fortunate enough that there was a university which used my business background to get me into organizational psychology or some mm. people call it business or industrial psychology so I did that. Uh, made, my first thesis was on, it was related to chronic illness, career identity, how a lot of us, our careers are derailed because of our illnesses. And with that, we lose our sense, not just of, of identity, but our career identity. And work and well-being is another theme, like um, learning about how, I think I read some statistic that 60% of the workforce um, have chronic illnesses and most people don't know about it. And I think that mm -hmm. might even mean like 90 million people in the United States and how these interplay. So the, the organizational psychology really allowed me to focus on that. And then after that, I went and decided uh, to follow up with another master's degree, which was in um, positive psychology and coaching psychology. And again, I focused all my theses and all my study around identity transition and the state of mind of people with chronic illness um I coached a lot of people as part of my course who you know, from the vasculitis community and then decided to uh, make this a a long-term endeavor and then recently um actually only in the last year um there's a society in england or in britain called the british psychological society which offers mm -hmm. a chartered membership and i i recently this you know the same year became a chartered a proper chartered psychologist with the british psychological society and their division of coaching which again i was loosely calling myself a psychologist before but once i got this um a few, only a few months ago i can officially say periodically yes sci psychologist now i can call myself that, not so. periodically we need to say it every day you yeah. earn every day. that okay <laughs> Did you not see how proud of you Amy is and how her face is just glowing and shining and smiling? She said, my husband is a psychologist, okay? Yeah. He came through the storm and he came out a psychologist, okay? Yeah. So take pride in that. Thank you. I think a lot of times people, one of the studies that I saw too is that people with chronic illnesses have, the, have um, to deal even more so with the imposter syndrome. And sometimes um, that questioning of whether we are qualified to do something or that fear that others are judging us because we didn't do it in the same way mm -hmm. or, you know, quite a few things that I kind of deduced from a few of the things that you said. It just said that we have to accept, I mean, all that you went through, all of life's challenges and struggles, but you still came out um, and furthered your education 
and actually acquired what really is a, a substantial you know, degree in something that's really helping so many in an area where I don't know too many in that particular field. You're, you're the first specialist in, you know, the area of career, you know, psychology or, you know, organizational psychology that I've actually been um, associated with. And you're chartered too in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to get those things in the UK. Y'all, it's harder over there, I hear. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) No. But I think this is just the whole um, experience of what you've been through is so special to hear um, what the two of you have actually also accomplished together. Because you also went back to school and got your degree, too, as well, Amy. I did. I did. I I got a master's degree in design management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From uh, London College of Fashion. It was kind of the springboard that got us kind of into repurposing and like working on this next chapter in our life. It was kind of that first spark. Yeah. And the way that I got to come to know you and come in contact with you because of your platform that you're utilizing on social media, on Instagram. And so now you've, you, we've, we've touched on so many things, the journey we've touched on the ways you've overcome it. We've touched on the connection with psychology and how you're using that knowledge and that background to really help others to make a difference. You've also, um, wrote, you know, papers and the, is it theses? Is, yeah, you I mean, theses? Still, tr- tried to, still try to get one published, but yeah, I've, I've written two theses. Um, okay. Yeah, on the d- dissertations, yeah. Dissertation. How, how, how big was that? I can't remember what for the accreditation. How how many thousand? Oh, that, oh yeah. So that was actually the, 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 for the getting chartered, that was actually the toughest one of, of the law. Yeah, of the it's law like a PhD design. level. Of work. Uh, um, I had to do. Um, I had to write. Uh, I think it was about forty thousand words in two months uh, for this. Um, oh no! And uh, <laughs> uh, that. <laughs> I mean, again, I, I. It's it's funny. But there's a thing again that you study in psychology. Maybe you've come across it anyway, Katina, because yeah, it's it's post traumatic growth whereby something happens a trauma i mean it can be an illness it could be something else and you just start to learn and surprise yourself mm-hmm. and obviously um i mean there are limitations and you know i'm not i'm not blind to the fact that there may be even with the illnesses there's still certain things which i have going for me and amy has going for her which i mean there will be people who have conditions which are which make them e- even less able to you know, work, work and kind of have the energy to do some of these things. And there are other factors which are working to our advantage too. But, you know, I, I, I do find that after going through what we went through, it was almost like this feeling of, wow, we, we did that. What else can we do? We, what yeah. else can we <laughs> learn about ourselves? Yeah. And you surprise yourself. And I think that, I think that what happens to, a lot of us and what happened to me uh before this was i was kind of going through like an autopilot just blindly just ticking along and then something a disruptor comes and just changes you know just kind of starts all these ripples in the pond like it's throwing a stone into a pond and you just you wake up and you have to switch on and that's and that's another thing i say i feel like we have since all this we have just switched on and it's funny because you think that you get physically weaker or more diminished, but in some ways, what got weaker physically got stronger. We were growing up here uh, yeah. because of that. Um, the, the kind of you know, there's other theories in psychology like the growth mindset and neuroplasticity. Like you, 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 you compensate. You get new strengths um, to compensate for some of the things that uh, you can't do anymore. But yeah, it just it just opened up this whole kind of questioning or open mindedness, like what else is possible? What else can we be doing? And just thinking outside of the box as well was another thing for us. Yeah. And that's kind of what has happened with me and my business. You know, um, being a nurse, I never saw myself as an entrepreneur. But when I felt drawn to really um, make a difference in people's lives and educating them about their health and wellness, I did something that I thought I never would do. And that's started a health coaching business. And then that health 
coaching business transitioned into a social media strategy business for people with chronic illnesses. And um, to think that I'm giving people guidance on business and guidance on how they can grow them effectively, but also maintain their health and balance um, and reduce and, you know, the, the reduce the chances of flare out flare ups and burnouts at the same time. To correlate all of that actually actually made things more meaningful, but I never saw myself doing that. And so I dealt with the imposter syndrome quite a bit, but navigating it has opened up an opportunity for me not to um, only grow in my business and do things like hosting events and partnering mm. with brands and meeting amazing people like you. Um, <laughs> you're, you're just as, as amazing, if not more yeah, so. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're, 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 I'm very impressed by you know your, oh. your, your, everything that you do yeah. in your operation. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm so um, impressed with the two of you. Um, there are so many lives that you're going to touch um, as individuals and as a couple. So keep up the amazing work and stay Thank in you. this journey. You were meant to do this. Um, walk in your purpose. Continue to advocate for um, yourself and others' health and um, make that difference you were meant to make. Um, I know you're already doing so much, I can see. So I'm excited to see your growth and to be a part of it. Um, so I would like to know, where can we find the two of you? Do you want to answer that one, Amy? Sure, well, sure. There's a couple places. Um, I think first, of, first and foremost, our webpage is illnesscoach.com. And we, are also have, we also have a YouTube channel, which is also called Illness Coach. And Instagram, which is Illness Coaching Psychologist. All right. So you you have those platforms, Instagram, you have the um you're going to be starting a podcast very soon. Yes, yes. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, we will. So be on the lookout for that. Check them out on all of those platforms. You'll get their information in the links that are going to be found in the show notes. I want you to also follow their page and their platform and reach out to them. And um, you might find that they have exactly what you need to get you on the other side of whatever challenges you're facing when it comes to your organizational psychology and your growth as a person living with chronic illness. So thank you so much for joining joining us. And I want to say, as I always say, my sisters, we may be inflamed, but we're still here. And as long as we're here, we might as well thrive together because inflamed sisters thrive together always. And that's sisters and brothers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Have an amazing day, everyone. And thank, thank you for you. joining us. Thank, thank you. you.